Greek portion is Vayashev, and it means any settle. Genesis 37, 1 through 40, 23. Our Torah portion is Amos 2, 6 through 3, 8. And the Apostolic or Messianic Scripture portion is 1 Corinthians 8, 10 through 13. The introduction. Jacob is living in the land where his father Isaac had sojourned, and his grandfather Abraham had done the same. Yet there is a slight difference because of the Hebrew words used. In Genesis 37, 1 it says, now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned, in the land of Canaan. The Hebrew word that's used for sojourner here is magor. And magor means a pilgrimage, sojourning, where he had sojourned, where they sojourned, etc., etc., etc. It's a different form of the word ger. Ger is the word that we commonly hear that's used in Scripture, and it means something different. So the indication here is possibly that it says now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned. It's kind of giving us the impression that Jacob is not settled yet. He's not settled in the land, in the promised land where he's supposed to be. He's still struggling with God. It's going to be a lifelong struggle with him until he reaches that point where he has the encounter with God. Who knows? It all depends on what your interpretation is or what it believes. You know, some say he had an encounter with Yeshua. Others say that he had an encounter with an angel of the Lord. Some say it was the angel over Esau. You know, and it just goes on and on and on with all the suppositions and everything that come out of that. I don't believe it was Yeshua myself. And the reason I don't believe it was Yeshua is because at the end of that struggle... The, whoever he struggled with asked him what his name was. And he told him what his name was. And he says, no, from now on you're going to be known as Israel. If that was Yeshua, if that was the Son of God, then that name would have taken place and stuck to him immediately at that point in time. But we know that later on, not that long after that, God himself speaks to Jacob. And he speaks to Jacob and he affirms the name of Israel. Why did he need to do that if it was already taken care of by the Messiah himself before that? So it kind of passes, you know, of, of who is the individual or the being, you know, for one of some say it was Satan that he wrestled with also. We don't have any definitive explanation as to who it was. All we know is, is that he wrestled this person and he wrestled him to a standstill. <coughs> And then at the end of that was when he asked for the blessing. And basically the blessing he got was this supposed name change. But he also went away with it permanently disabled. That his thigh was struck. And it said right after that, that because of that, the Israelites, and even to this day the Jewish people, do not eat that meat that's in, in that area of the hip joint that's in there because of what happened to Jacob. So, while it's, it's an interesting thing, he comes away with that with a permanent problem that I think would always cause him to reflect back upon this struggle that he had. But he also leaves this basically a changed person. He's not the same person that he was as he was going into this. And you have to realize the fact, don't forget, he had already had a problem with you know, he was having a problem with Laban, and he fled from Laban. Laban caught up with him. They basically made a peace treaty. He goes on, and he knows that the next thing he's going to encounter is his brother, and his brother's coming to honor him with 400 men. Now, if you really think that his brother was coming to honor him with 400 men, we had this discussion at, in La Luz last week, and it was kind of a different... Bruce had a different perspective. On it. It's a barbecue. <laughs> so, they were kind of, you know, and I was saying, he was not bringing an honor guard to meet his brother. Not with 400 men coming with that. He was coming to wipe out his brother, all his relatives, anybody who could possibly have any connection or want to have that inheritance. I think it was Esau's position that he wanted that inheritance. 
21 years later and he still was mad. And he wanted to make sure that Jacob couldn't get that. But God had other plans. And Jacob also wasn't stupid. In that encounter, after it's done and they make peace and everything, you know, Esau says, well, come along with me, you know, we'll, we'll travel together. And Jacob comes up with an excuse, well, I have all these little ones, and I have all of this, and I have all of that, and I'm not going to be able to go as fast as you can. You go on ahead, and I'll catch up with you. So Esau says, okay, that's fine. Esau goes on ahead. Jacob goes in the other direction. Smart. <laughs> the other thing that happens in that incident also is later on what you read is Esau moves out of the land. He goes to the place that God gave to him. God gave him a different part of the land, not the land that he had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Esau, I think, came also, he also came to the understanding of the covenant and the fact that he had lost the right of the firstborn, the birthright, and he also gave up the firstborn inheritance also, which is a double portion. He lost both. Granted that the way Jacob, you know, well, Jacob didn't really mislead him the first time. Esau claims that he misled him the first time. You know, it was Jacob who came back. I mean, it was Esau who came back from his hunting trip swearing to Jacob that he was going to die of hunger that if he didn't get a bowl of lentil stew. Lentil stew. You know, giving up your birthright for a bowl of stew. That is why God, I believe in Scripture, and God says it, and it's a literal translation that comes out of that. He says, I hate Esau. It's literal. It's the only way the word's translated. It comes out of the Hebrew and it means hate. So God did not appreciate what Esau had done where he really thought very little of his inheritance. He didn't think much of it at all. He didn't want to please his parents by marrying the people, you know, who he said, because usually there was the right of the father to choose who the bride was. And apparently Esau made his own choice. The only time that Esau did anything that he thought may please his uh, parents was when he knew that they were sending Jacob away and they were sending him back to his mother's home, to Laban's house, to find a bride there. The thing was is that Esau thinks that he's going to please his parents. He marries a daughter of Ishmael. Isaac and Ishmael, you know, they weren't exactly on the best of terms. You know, being the fact that Ishmael and his mother were exiled, basically, by Abraham at Sarah's insistence. And it was Sarah who had insisted in the beginning that Abraham sleeps with Hagar. And then winds up having Ishmael by it. But Ishmael was never the child of promise. The inheritance was never meant for him. And even to this day, if you read the Koran, if you ever look at it, Ishmael is the one who's mentioned as the son of promise. And then it was Ishmael and Abraham who developed Islam. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, come on. Grab on to that one, people. In Genesis 17, 8, it says, And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojourn, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. In Genesis 23, 4, I am a stranger and a sojourner among you. Give me a burial site among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. There's two words that are used here for sojourner. Sojourner in this passage of scripture, one of the uses of the word is ger. Ger means an alien or a foreigner. But usually it's used with inherited rights. Being means they're granted rights. They don't inherit them because they're not born into this family or into this people, but they choose to sojourn among this people. And by sojourning among this people, it means that they've accepted the God of that people. And they've accepted the covenant of that people. And when they do that, then they get rights. 
These rights are basically given to them as long as they're following the ways of the people. The other word that's used there where you have stranger is the Hebrew word toshav. That's also translated as sojourner, but it also can mean a foreign resident or a tenant. So it's a temporary resident. It's not somebody who has permanent status in the land. And these were the words that were spoken in the description that Abraham made about himself as he was seeking a burial spot for Sarah, his wife. And we all know the story about what happened there. And we also know the modern story about that is because that was Hebron and that's where the patriarchs and their wives are supposed to be buried. And Israel, the Jewish people, gave it back to the Palestinians. I think they have an accounting before God because of that. Because the land is not there. And if you think about it, none of the land that we live on on this earth actually belongs to us. It's all God's possession. God allows us to be tenants, basically. And that we're supposed to be caretakers of the promise that he gives us. And did Israel do what God wanted them to do and be the caretakers that they were supposed to be? No, they did not. And they had to count it with God because of that. But every nation on the face of the earth that comes against God's people, despite what God is going to do with his people, he promises never, never to give up that covenant he made with them. And, you know, very sadly... Yesterday, our country made a huge mistake. A huge mistake. That's going to come back to bite us eventually when you think about it. You know, our leaders claim, oh, we, do, we, we didn't veto, we didn't do, you know, we, we didn't do that. Thing. We just abstain. Same thing. Same thing. No difference. Allowing that to pass. And then they go, well, it doesn't really have any force anyway. It doesn't mean anything or whatever. Yes, everything will color future engagements and future discussions and everything. And I don't blame Israel for being mad because up to the day before yesterday, when uh, Egypt backed out of backing it because of the insistence of uh, our future president, that he actually did something good in doing that, standing up. And he did that, but he also urged our present president not to do it, and he chose not to. He chose to do what he wanted to do. It's a parting shot. As the frustration that he's had because he couldn't bring peace. Yeah, anybody who tries to meddle in trying to make peace in the Middle East is a fool. You can't do it unless God wants it. And God doesn't want it. Not now, not yet. There will be a time that there will be peace, believe it or not. All you have to do is read the prophecies and you know that something will happen. But it's all part of God's plan. It's all part of His plan. It's all going to have to take place in His time and how He wants to do it. He will choose the people that He wants to bring it about. But anybody who is contrary to God's will has a penalty and a day of reckoning to come against them. And God tells us that he does this in Scripture. Even though he sent Abraham and Isaac down to Egypt to protect them for a time, he says that Egypt has a day of reckoning with him because of what they've done to his people. God uses Egypt for his purpose, but yet could that picture of Egypt also be a bigger picture of the rest of the world? And what God has used the rest of the world for. God exiled his people, his covenant people, to the four corners of the earth. They were all over the place. They were everywhere out there. They're still out there. It's only now in our day that the population in Israel has basically either come even or just slightly surpassed the population of those in exile out there in the the earth. But God is going to gather his people because we don't have many people that are out there that have a connection to Israel. People have a connection to Israel in so many different ways that it's amazing. We just don't know. We don't understand. It's all part of God's plan. And we just have to realize this. We have to understand that. Abraham 
owned the peace of the promised land. He purchased that burial place in Hebron. So the Jewish people should not have given it back. They should not have done that. You, and I've said it before, and I truly believe it. You cannot trade land for peace. You can't do it. Because the people that you're trying to deal with don't want peace. They have no desire to have peace. The only thing they want to do is make sure that their version of the map of the Middle East is the one that's effective, and their map of the Middle East shows no Israel on it. That's what they desire, that's what they want, that's what they teach in their schools. But everybody wants to ignore it. I really don't know why. Why are they so afraid of the Arabs? It just doesn't make no sense to me whatsoever why they're afraid of them. You know, years ago, and a lot of the younger people wouldn't remember it, there was an oil embargo. And many of us sat in long lines just to try to get a tank of gas back then. It wasn't a pleasant situation, and it's you know, lines would stretch around. You know, I lived in Philadelphia at the time. Lines would stretch around the blocks. You're going to big lines. You're going there waiting hours, burning up the gas that you're going to go and get. Why are we so worried about that anymore? Because they don't make up the bulk of our imports. We have the capabilities here in this country of producing all the oil that we need. We don't need that. So why do we depend on that? You know? Why do we depend on people who hate us? That's the problem that we have that's out there. And a lot of people don't like God's people. They always seem to want to focus on the fact that the Jews did this, the Jews did that, and blah, 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 and all those other things. And even some of their own brethren do the same thing. Because the reality is in the Middle East, almost everybody's related in one way or another. You can't get around that fact. Because of all, all the different you know, minglings with the families. You have all these different things. The only ones that they don't really have any, that they're not kin to, are the Iranians. Anybody connected with the Persian part of the family line, forget it, it's not part of the family line. They're separate from that. They have nothing to do with that. That's why Saudi Arabia and Iran hate each other. Because each one represents a different form of Islam. But Saudi Arabia these days is getting the short end of the stick too, and, and a day of reckoning is coming for them as well. There's going to be some major changes, I believe, coming in the Middle East. And the power setup that's there. And Israel is sitting right in the middle of this, what do you want to call it, you know, turmoil, just waiting for it to blow up. You know, and just figuring, we're just going to keep our heads down. But right now, they're mad at us. They are absolutely fuming over what happened yesterday. And I don't blame them. I really don't. And you wonder why Israel has been drifting closer and closer to Russia. You know, you have to look at these different things that are taking place out there and, and how things are changing rapidly. Things that we wouldn't have believed could have happened, you know, not that long ago. But God is moving things in the Middle East. And God is moving things through other parts of the world. And the thing that I always tell people is, look to the Middle East to see what's happening in the rest of the world because everything centers there. Everything centers and revolves around Israel. Israel is the center. Not any other country on the face of the earth that claims that they're a superpower. There are no superpowers. There are none left. The superpower would be an absolute country they can do what they want without worrying about the consequences and defeating anybody who would come against them. There isn't one country that can claim that anymore. The only country that would have that status if they would just, is Israel. If they would put their faith in God, they would be the superpower. If they would follow God's covenant, the Torah, they would have the authority and the power. If they would embrace Messiah, think about it. what could happen. 
Think about that. That would be a seismic shift in the Middle East and how things. It would be a seismic shift throughout the rest of the world as to what would be happening. Amen. Tell it, Rabbi. Tell it. <laughs> I'm going to edit that out. Through. I'm going to edit that out. Tell the truth. Amos 2, 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. Because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted. A man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profane. They lay themselves down with, beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. So here the prophet Amos is saying, this is what the Lord has to say. I hold these three transgressions against Israel. And then he goes on and says, well, there's four. And I won't revoke the punishment. So you can be God's covenant people but you can still face punishment. You can believe in the Messiah, but you can still face punishment. There is an accounting for your sin. No matter what that somebody tries to tell you that, okay, you accept Messiah and your sins are wiped away, where in Scripture does it tell you that your sins are wiped away? It says that the Messiah takes your sins upon yourself, but there's still a day of reckoning. You still have a day of an accounting with the Lord. Israel can have their sins forgiven, they embrace Messiah and follow the covenant, but there's still a day of accounting, a day of reckoning with God. We all will have that. And he goes on and he says, they sell the righteous for silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth, and turn aside the way of the afflicted, a man and his father go into the same girl, so that my holy name is profane. That's forbidden in Torah. It's a violation of Torah. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. What are we told about a garment taken in pledge? That's the outer garment of an individual who gives it in pledge because they have a loan that they have to repay. But the Torah specifies that at the end of the day that garment is to be returned to the individual because that is the blanket that they use to sleep with and keep the cold out. So here they're saying that they took their garments in pledge and did not return them. That they used them for themselves. But the other thing that was very bad is they say they laid themselves down beside every altar. That's paganism. That's the route that Israel chose. Both houses chose the route of paganism. And God has a problem with that. I don't blame him. God tells us he's a jealous God. And in that jealousy, he says, I will not share myself with any other God. And every time you see the word God in that sense used in Scripture, it's always a small G. It's never a big G. There's only one big G in the Bible. <laughs> and in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. They do everything they can to rub God's nose in the fact that they're not going to keep His covenant, that they're going to choose to do what they want to do. And God does not like that. But He does not say that He's going to revoke His covenant with Israel. He will not do that. Why? Because He gave His word. The one thing that God doesn't do is break His word. He does not break His word. He does not break His covenant. Remember, his word doesn't go. His word has to go out, and it has to find completion. It has to find its mark. It cannot return to him unfulfilled. We're told that in Isaiah 29, starting in verse 21, who cause a people to be indicted by a word, and ensnare him who adjudicates at the gate, and defraud the one in the right with meaningless arguments. Therefore, thus says the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob. Jacob shall not now be ashamed, nor shall his face now turn pale. But when he sees his children, the work of my hands, in his midst, they will sanctify my name. Indeed, they will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. 
Those who err in mind will know the truth, and those who criticize will accept instruction. So, that means there's going to be a major shift in the attitude of a lot of people. And a lot of people are going to learn that they need to do what God tells them to do, and they need to follow God's covenant because that's the way you please Him. You please Him by following His covenant. Don't make up your own covenant and think that that's going to make Him happy. He gave us a covenant. He gave us a covenant, and we do the best that we can to try to follow it. Yes, there might be different interpretations about how to follow that covenant. But if you're following that covenant and everybody else is doing it different, don't you think you should take another look at the way that you're keeping that covenant? That maybe you could be off the mark. Maybe we're all off the mark. Maybe we're all not doing the way, you know, following the covenant the way that we're supposed to be, that we're doing the best that we can. A lot of us look to the Jewish people to see how they're doing the covenant. But they don't get the covenant right all the time. In fact, there's a lot of times they're not even following the covenant. Okay? What they're following in Scripture is the rabbinic covenant. The rabbinic teaching. The rabbinic teachings have their place, but they're commentary. They're not law. They're not force of law. They come from men. They don't come from God. They're man's interpretation of what they believe God is saying, but for the most part, they're not even trying to tell you what God says. They're trying to tell you what they want and what they desire. Originally, those rules started out as just an interpretation of a way to protect the actual Torah itself. But the problem that came out of it was is that they elevated those rules to the same level and then eventually beyond God's written Torah. <coughs> and they claimed the authority for that was given to them by Joshua. That Joshua received this oral law from Moses. You know, they use a couple of different passages of scriptures to say this. I don't believe that. I don't accept that whatsoever. I do believe that there's a different interpretation that's in there for, for what it is, but this oral Torah, as they call it, this is what they follow today. They're not following the Torah that God gave. They're following the oral interpretation that man gave. And when we start following the rules of men and elevate them and say that these are the rules of God, and in a lot of cases, the Jewish people tell you or the Jewish rabbis tell you that their interpretations are higher than God's, that God gave man the Torah, and God gave man the authority to interpret the Torah. So basically, in one of their writings, they said they told God to butt out of the conversation that they were having over a dispute over the Torah. That takes a lot of chutzpah. <laughs> You're going to tell God to butt out of the conversation of the Torah that he gave to them? I really think, and that is actually in, in the rabbinic writings. That's in there. And God actually commended the one point of view that upheld God's position while all the other rabbis said, no, he was wrong. So in other words, they said not only was this other rabbi wrong, but that God would have to be wrong by connection to this because they decided that this rabbi was wrong. So in effect, they judge God. I think in the day of judgment, they're going to have a problem. That God's going to judge them and they're not going to be too happy. I wonder if God's going to bring it up and go, remember that day you had that conversation? And I think they're going to stand there and they're going to look at one another and they're going to go, what conversation? What are you talking about? And God's going to go, snap his fingers in there it's going to start playing on the big screen TV. You know? HD. It's going to be, oh, it's big screen. Big screen. And it's going to be up there, and it's going to be playing right across there, and they're going to be, I think, shrinking in there. You know, getting smaller and smaller and going, oh boy. <laughs> but a lot of us, you know, we just can't point the finger to somebody else and say that it's all going to be their problem. We have things that we have to answer for. We have things that we have to give an accounting for. Will it keep us out of the kingdom? That's up to God. He's the judge. 
That's the end result of that, that we look at people differently than God looks at them. Because God doesn't judge just the actions and the works that they do on the outside. God judges the heart. God looks deep down inside of us and He sees what's in our heart. And that's what He judges us by. But He also judges us by our actions too. And if your actions line up with where your heart is at, and your heart's in the wrong place, like these world powers that think they're the ones who are the arbitrators of what is going to happen in the Middle East, they're fools. The only one they're fooling are themselves. But they don't want to believe that. One day they will. One day they will. Ezekiel 22.8 You have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbath. There are men in you who slander to shed blood, and people in you who eat on the mountains. They commit lewdness in your midst. In you men uncover their father's nakedness. In you they violate women who are unclean in their menstrual impurity. One commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. Another in you violates his sister, his father's daughter. You know, I, it just struck me in this passage of Scripture in verse 10 where it said, And you men uncover their father's nakedness. That took me right back to Ham's sin with Noah. Right back to that. And I believe that this is making reference to that. And bringing it out. Is it saying what actually happened? Did he just uncover his nakedness? Rabbinic opinion. Some of it tells you that something else occurred. And all these different things. You know, and blah, blah, blah. I think basically what it comes down to is it's talking about the actions of these people beyond just these physical sins that they're doing. God is also talking about how they violate his covenant. And how it doesn't please him. And that... They are basically prostituting themselves. They're prostituting themselves with God's covenant and taking His covenant and making it nothing. They make His covenant an abomination. His covenant becomes an abomination and then the people of the world, the people of the earth, look at them and they look and they go, we see no difference with this people than we see among ourselves. And that's not what God's people were supposed to do. They're supposed to stand out. The thing about it is, is that I have to face the reality that a Jewish person usually does stand out. No matter how much they try to blend in, no matter where they live, somehow they always pop to the surface and they stand out. For good or bad, they stand out. You know, kind of during the Middle Ages, Christians told the Jews that the only business that they could be in is lending, banking, because they didn't want to dirty their hands with touching money. The Jews became very wealthy off of that. When the Christians saw that the Jews were getting wealthy, then they told them that you can't do that anymore. We're going to take that away from you. It's all going to belong to us. And it's kind of, you know, they want to punish them for being who they are but all they're doing is going to hurt themselves because God will hold them accountable. It all comes down to what God desires and what God wants. In Leviticus 20, starting in verse 2, Say to the people of Israel, Any one of the people of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel, who gives any of his children to Molech, shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I myself will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people. Because he has given one of his children to Molech to make my sanctuary unclean and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do at all close their eyes to that man when he gives one of his children to Molech and do not put him to death, then I will set my face against that man and against his clan, and will cut them off from among their people, him and all who follow him, in whoring after Molech. This is back in Leviticus, and yet we know one king of Israel that violated this commandment. Solomon. 
We don't know how many children he sacrificed to Molech, but we're told that he did honor and sacrifice to Molech. Solomon, given the gift of wisdom, the gift that he asked for to be able to rule his people, he was so wise he was stupid. Sorry, you know, you can be as smart as you want, but sometimes the smartest people are the stupidest people. Okay, because they get so caught up in being so smart that they forget about the reality of having common sense. Common sense can take you a lot further than a lot of knowledge and a lot of understanding because a lot of knowledge, a lot of the time, the more knowledge you get, the more you want because you're trying to explain things when you get all this knowledge and you're trying to figure things out and suddenly it doesn't line up the way you're thinking so you've got to get more knowledge in order to try to work it out. When common sense tells you, leave it up to God. Just follow God. That's the easiest way to do it. In 1 Corinthians 8, 10 through 13. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged? If his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols. And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. The brother for whom Messiah died. The sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Messiah. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. So is the Apostle Paul, or the Shaliach Shaul, because that would have been his actual way they would have spoke about him back then. Shaliach means apostle or messenger also, because that's what apostle means. It means a messenger. It means a sent out one. And Shaul was actually his Hebrew name. So, did he actually mean that he was not going to eat meat anymore? No, what he's saying is he's not going to eat meat or food that's been sacrificed or offered to idols. And he's talking about people in the Corinth congregation who apparently are supposed to know better and they're going in and they're partaking of food in the idol's temple, okay, where their brethren can see them, new people who are believers in Messiah, they can see them, and if they see them doing this, then their own faith will be weakened. And that's what we have to be careful of because we need to be careful of the things that we say and do. Because it can affect somebody else who's not, if you want to call them a mature believer or whatever. But anybody who would violate this and do this anyway, are they really a mature believer? A mature believer tries to do what God wants them to do. It doesn't mean you're going to do it perfect. It doesn't mean you're going to get it right the first time. But you've got to try. You've got to start somewhere. If you don't start somewhere, how are you ever going to learn and how are you ever going to grow in your walk? You know, there's always that one thing that happens. You can take two steps forward and you can take one step back. Consider it a victory that you advance at least one step. Because then the next time it happens, you'll advance another step and another step. And you'll grow in your faith. The one thing you don't want to do is keep going backwards or you don't want to stagnate. You don't want to get stuck and just walk in place. It does you no good because it's not going to help you. In Romans 14, 15. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Messiah died. So now, he's talking about the Roman congregation. So, this is obviously a regular problem in the congregations that are planted in former pagan places. Because they're planted in the midst of paganism. These are pagan countries. They worship thousands of gods. Each one has their own personal gods and their different things that they do there. Paul wound up finding that it was easy for him to be able to go in and share with them. But then he saw this rising problem that he was having in these various congregations because of reports that were coming back. People who claimed that they were believing in Messiah were going back to the pagan temples and going back to worship there and bringing sacrifices there. That's a problem that we have today. 
that's the reality. The truth of it is, is that how many people come out of the church or even come out of Judaism, if you, want to, if you want to call it that, and take a look at that, and come into embracing Messiah and walking in that walk and trying to learn Torah and trying to find out how you fit the walk of Torah in with your faith in Messiah. But how many of them fall back and wind up getting pulled back into the church or into the synagogue because they don't know how to move forward. But they also find out that this walk is not as easy as they thought it was supposed to be. It's not an easy walk. It was never meant to be that way. Following Messiah is not that simple. Following Messiah is to imitate him in the way that he lived, in the way that he walked. So every opportunity that we have, we're supposed to be an example. So condemning them because of everything they do really doesn't do us any good. But the reality is, is that we have the opportunity to share you know, Julian shared how he was able to share with his boss, and then he offended the deacon in the Baptist church. <laughs> so that's okay. He came back and apologized to you. So that means you ticked his conscience. So his conscience was ticked, and he went back and had him take a look at his own actions and how he was presenting himself. You don't know the impressions that you make upon somebody. You never do. Okay? So you always have to be aware of the fact of what you do and you have to stand up for what you believe in. It doesn't mean you have to get into a pitch battle about it because you never usually win those things. But you stand up for what you believe and you share what you can. Remember something. If you're going to fight the all-out war right now, you're going to lose. But if you pick your battles, you can win every so often. And the more you pick your battles, the more you win the more you'll be able to share and the stronger you'll become in your faith because you'll learn exactly what you're going to face. Because when you share with a Christian about what they're doing, it's not the same as sharing with a Jew and what they're doing. There's a difference in their belief system. There's a difference in who they are and what they believe and how they live out their lives and what they do. As many Christians as there are out there, on a smaller scale, there's a whole lot of Jews too that believe in different ways. So when people come to me, and people used to, they don't do that much anymore. And they say, I have a Jewish friend, how do I witness to them? My first question is, is what kind of a Jew are they? And I don't get a response. I just get this look like, huh? There are different denominations in Judaism the same as there are in Christianity. And Jews have their own beliefs in each one of these different groups. The same as different churches have different beliefs in the churches that they go to. Everybody interprets something different. Everybody usually locks on to a couple of scriptures, and that becomes their foundational scripture. I think what you need to lock on to is all of scripture. And try to do what you can that God gives us, and the foundation that he lays for us. You know, people want to say, well, we're going to follow the teachings of Messiah. I go, great, you're going to follow the Torah. And they go, huh? I go, that's what Yeshua taught. He taught the Torah. Take what he taught, compare it, go back and look. And do a word search in Scripture. And I guarantee you, everything that he taught, you're going to find in the Torah. You're going to find it. And that's the thing about Scripture. Scripture confirms Scripture. If Scripture, if you find Scriptures that are in opposition to one another, sometimes you just need to go back and research that and look at the passage in its fuller context and not in just one verse. You need to see the context that it's laid out in. You need to see how it's being used because Scripture will not contradict Scripture. Scripture will reinforce that. And if you still come away with feeling that Scripture contradicts Scripture, don't let it affect your faith. One or two Scriptures that against thousands of Scriptures, set it aside until you can resolve it. And go on with your walk. Romans 14.21 It is good not to eat meat 
or drink wine, or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. So, is he saying that if, if, you're eat, if you're going to drink wine, that you're also doing something that's wrong? If you're doing it to idols. Talking about pagan worship. If you're doing it to idols, if you're eating meat sacrificed to idols, if you're drinking wine sacrificed to idols or being offered to an idol, then you're causing your brother to stumble if your brother sees you doing this because you're supposed to be better than that. Because that goes contrary to what the Apostle Paul taught to his congregation, and it goes contrary to Tobit. In Matthew 20, 25, 40, and the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. I'm going to close with this. Torah man says, Egotism is the art of seeing things in yourself that others cannot see. 